After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight f3 d6, 3 d4. Which is the best way to guard the king pawn? 3 knight c6 or 3 knight d7. Correct. Developing the knight, 3, knight b8, d7, in front of the queen, works out best in this variation of Philidor's defense. 1, e2, e4, e7, e6, 2, knight g1, f3, d7, d6. The point is that if white initiates an exchange of pawns on e5, black can take back with his d-pawn, avoiding the trade of queens. 4, d4 takes e5, d6 takes e5. This works because the knight on d7 shields the queen from capture. But with the queen knight on c6 instead of d7, the queen trade cannot be avoided because white has the power to force open the d-file. 3, knight b8, c6, 4, d4 takes e5. And now white ensures a favorable queen trade by either 4, d6 takes e5, 5, queen d1 takes d8, check, or 4, knight c6 takes e5, 5, knight f3 takes e5, d6 takes e5, 6, queen d1 takes d8, check. Let's also examine the different effect of the light square bishop's pin, first when the knight is on c6, then when it instead occupies d7. When the knight is on c6, the move 4, bishop f1, b5 is strong. It securely pins the knight to the king, and the knight can't move. But with the knight on d7, the move 4, bishop f1, b5 is weak. It can be answered by the pin breaking 4, c7, c6, forcing the bishop to move again and thereby gaining time. In summary, 3, knight b8, d7 is better than 3, knight b8, c6 for at least two reasons. First, it thwarts white's attempt to trade queens. Second, it enables black to cope with the pin of the f1 bishop if it comes to b5. After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight f3, knight c6, 3 d4, how should black take white's queen pawn? 3 e takes d4, or 3 knight c6 takes d4. Correct. In the Scotch game, 1, e2, e4, e7, e5, knight g1, f3, knight b8, c6, 3, d2, d4, the capture 3, e5 takes d4 follows the general rule and is the right response. What rule are we talking about? The one that recommends starting a series of captures by taking the least valuable unit and finishing the series by taking with the unit of highest value. The logic is simple. By starting a sequence of captures with the least valuable unit, you safeguard yourself against oversights and mistakes. Whenever you're not sure about the correctness of the transaction you're entering upon, it's better to endanger a less valuable unit, such as a pawn, rather than to risk a more valuable piece, such as the queen. Of course, this is a general principle. It shouldn't be adhered to absolutely. If your examination of a given position concludes that you should first take with your more valuable unit, please do so. In chess, specific move-by-move -move analysis, deduction, always takes precedence over generalized assumptive reasoning, induction. After the queen pawn is captured, 3 e5 takes d4, White should also follow the rule, recapturing with the less valuable of his two possible recapturers. He should take with the knight, 4, knight f3 takes d4, saving the queen as backup, to answer 4, knight c6 takes d4 by 5, queen d1 takes d4. 
Black doesn't win material when he captures on d4, 3, e5 takes d4. He merely trades pawns, but he does gain something, and this is time. By taking on d4, black puts white in the position of having to expend a tempo in order to regain the captured pawn. After white uses a turn to take back, 4, knight f3 takes d4, the next free move is Black's to do whatever he wants or deems logical. So, by trading pawns, Black obtains freedom of choice for his next move. In other words, he gains the initiative. After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight f3, knight c6, 3 bishop b5, should black counterattack or defend? 3 a6 or 3 d6? Correct. The choice of most strong players is the counterattack 3 a7 a6. It forces a decision. Either the bishop will retreat to a4 when black acquires the future option of ending the bishop's attack on the c6 knight by the pawn block b7 b5, or the bishop will have to capture the c6 knight. This impairs the queenside pawn structure, but forfeits the advantage of the two bishops. You have the two bishop advantage if you possess two bishops and your opponent has two knights or one bishop and one knight. After 4, bishop b5 takes c6, black should take back with the queen pawn, 4, d7 takes c6, which is capturing away from the center. In most situations, one captures toward the center, usually for greater central control and to avoid inferior pawn imbalances. But here black must capture away from the center for tactical reasons. It enables black to defend his assailed king pawn indirectly. If white now continues 5, knight f3 takes e5, black regains the pawn with the double attack 5, queen d8, d4, thanks to the open queen file created by taking away from the center d7 takes c6 on move 4. After the ensuing 6, knight e5, f3, queen d4 takes e4, check, 7, queen d1, e2, Black trades queens and comes out with an excellent game. After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight f3, knight c6, 3 bishop c4, which is the right counter? 3 a6 or 3 knight f6? Correct. The better of the two choices is 3, knight g8, f6. Black activates a new piece, attacks the enemy king pawn, generally eyes the center, and prepares kingside castling. But there is one catch. The soft spot, f7, defended only by black's king. White can produce a combined attack against f7 by moving the king knight to g5 where it joins forces with the c4 bishop to menace this vulnerable square. How can black cope with the threat to f7? Not actually by guarding it, but by blocking out the c4 bishop with 4, d7, d5. This works, but the lines are intricate, and black better know them quite well to escape unscathed. If he's not familiar with all the nuances of 3, knight g8, f6, he should find an alternative third move, not 3, a7, a6, that avoids complications. An excellent option is 3, bishop f8, c5. It deters white from moving his knight to g5 because black's queen still guards this square. This is not true after 3, knight g8, f6, because the queen is obstructed by the f6 knight, so g5 becomes unprotected and therefore usable.
After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight f3, knight c6, 3 knight c3, which is the better of the two moves? 3 bishop c5, or 3 h6. Correct. The developing move 3 bishop f8 c5 gets the nod, even though it's not the best developing move. This distinction goes to the knightly development 3 knight g8 f6. The problem with 3 bishop f8 c5 here is something called the fork trick, which white initiates by taking black's e5 pawn. 4 knight f3 takes e5. It works like this. After 3 bishop f8 c5, white temporarily sacrifices his king knight. 4 knight f3 takes e5. If black takes back with the knight, 4 knight c6 takes e5. He could also give back the piece by 4 bishop c5 takes f2 check, trying to endanger white's king. He suddenly has two minor pieces in a forkable position. The bishop on c5 and the knight on e5. White can hit them both with the same pawn move. 5, d2, d4. This will regain the piece, leaving white with more space, better development, and a more aggressive position. Black can still defend himself, but he's lost ground by allowing the fork trick. After 1 e4 e5, 2 f4, bishop c5, 3 knight f3, which is a better move? 3 e5 takes f4, or 3 d6. Correct. The truer move is 3d7, d6, guarding the e5 pawn. At first glance it may seem that black is outgunned on e5, for white attacks this point with two units, the f4 pawn and the f3 knight, while black guards it with only one, the d6 pawn. But the e5 pawn has an indirect defender as well, the queen at d8. If the f3 knight ever leaves its post, Black's queen checks on h4 and follows with an even more devastating check on e4. A particularly drastic scenario is 3d7, d6, 4, f4 takes e5, d6 takes e5, 5, knight f3 takes e5, queen d8, h4, check, 6, king e1, e2, Queen h4 takes e4 checkmate. Thus we see that push 3d7 d6 does provide sufficient defense for the moment. White can follow by taking once on e5, 4 f4 takes e5, but not by taking twice, 5 knight f3 takes e5. The weakness of the e1 h4 diagonal holds him back. After 1 e4 e5, 2 knight c3, knight f6, 3 f4, what should black do with his d pawn? 3 d5 or 3 d6? Correct. Aggression with the two-square advance, 3d7, d5, is the way to go. It does not provide direct protection to e5, but it counterattacks, which is the most active form of defense. It's also the best way to answer white's somewhat flankish attack, 3f2, f4, by hitting back in the middle. Black meets white's attack on his e5 pawn by a counterthreat to white's e4 pawn. So if 4, f4 takes e5, black answers 4, knight f6 takes e4. 
This keeps the material and the position in balance. After 1 e4 e5, 2 bishop c4, knight f6, 3 knight c3, should black move the knight or the bishop. 3, knight takes e4, or 3, bishop e7. Correct. The votes are in, and the winner is the fork trick. 3, knight f6 takes e4. By temporarily sacrificing a knight, black knocks out white's center pawn. Then white has two ways to go. He could take back immediately, 4, knight c3 takes e4, which encounters the pawn fork, 4, d7, d5. The outcome is that black wins back the minor piece, either the c4 bishop or the e4 knight, re-establishing material equality. Or, before taking on e4, white could first sacrifice his c4 bishop, 4 bishop c4 takes f7 check, figuring he's going to lose back the piece anyway. So why not do it by messing up the opponent's king? After 4, king e8 takes f7, 5, knight c3 takes e4, however, black still answers with 5, d7, d5, threatening the e4 knight and forming aligned pawns in the middle. Black's king is slightly at risk, but this is probably outweighed by black's central chances. The advice for white after 3, knight f6 takes e4 is to turn the opening into a gambit, this can be achieved by either 4, knight g1, f3, simply activating a new piece and preparing castling, or 4, queen d1, h5, enlisting the aid of the queen and converting to full-scale warfare. I especially recommend playing such gambits to developing players even when the attacking lines they choose are a little unsound. In trying to make them work, the student will be exercising and improving his tactical skills. Necessity will force him to be more creative. If you want to develop a particular style, enmesh yourself in it every chance you get and watch your play mature. After 1 e4 e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, should black copy white or do something different? 3, knight takes e4, or 3, d6. Correct. This is the right way, 3, d7, d6, to regain the pawn. First, black drives back the e5 knight. After the e5 knight withdraws to f3, then black can safely recapture the pawn, 4, knight f6 takes e4, without fear of being pinned. If white does follow with 5, queen d1, e2, pinning the knight, black's queen can move to e7, defending the knight and breaking the pin. Even if white then drives back the intruder with 6, d2, d3, the knight can retreat to f6 and the game is balanced. After 1, e4, e5, 2, d4, e takes d4, 3, c3, should black accept the gambit or defend the d-pawn? 3, d takes c3, or 3, c5. Correct. Black should put white to the test by capturing the proffered pawn. 3, d4, takes c3. 
White will then either play four, knight b1 takes c3, the half Danish gambit, also called the Goring gambit, or offer a second pawn with four, bishop f1, c4, c3 takes b2, five, bishop c1 takes b2, the Danish gambit proper. In both cases, white gets a jump in development, as his pieces come out far more expeditiously than black's. White also has more play in the center, since he has a pawn asserting itself on e4. But black has committed no errors, and his game is fundamentally sound. With accurate defense, he should be able to neutralize white's attack and survive to tell the tale. This doesn't mean that black is winning, though, for one false step, and the story comes to an unhappy end for black. After one e4 c5, two knight f3 d6, three d4, should black capture the queen pawn or increase the pressure? Three c takes d4, or three knight c6? Correct. The capture makes sense. For this is why black played the Sicilian defense, 1, e2, e4, c7, c5, in the first place, to be able to exchange queen bishop pawn for queen pawn once white expands with d2, d4. After the exchange, black winds up with two central pawns versus white's one, which means that black ultimately has a good chance to dominate the middle, if he can cope with white's early initiative and attack. This he can do because the center pawns provide an excellent bulwark against white's assault. Theoretically, the exchange on d4 lays the groundwork for black's subsequent counterplay on the c-file. When it becomes feasible, black will eventually post a rook, probably the queen rook, at c8, where it exerts pressure straight into white's camp. With a rook positioned on c8, black is able to affect the key square c4. Since white often develops the king bishop to c4, moving a rook to c8 may give black the opportunity for some sharp tactics against it. Moreover, black might also use c4 as a terrific overlook for a knight, or any black piece for that matter. The queen knight typically gets there via two routes, going from c6 to e5 to c4, or from c6 to a5 and then c4. Either way, these attractive possibilities require a half-open c-file, open just for black, so that the invading knight can be supported. How does black obtain a half-open c-file? By exchanging his c-pawn for white's d-pawn. After 1 e4 c5, 2 knight f3, knight c6, 3 d4, how should black take white's pawn? 3 c takes d4, or 3 knight takes d4? Correct. Taking with the pawn, 3, c5 takes d4 is best. It complies with the general capture rule, which advocates taking with your least valuable unit unless there is a definite reason for doing otherwise. For example, suppose you have a situation where taking with your queen gives mate. In such a case, are you really going to worry about violating the principle? After the exchange of pawns on d4, 3, c5 takes d4, 4, knight f3 takes d4, black obtains the next free move, the next move that does not require a particular response. True, white's d4 knight is then in position to capture black's c6 knight, but this is not a threat. The c6 knight is adequately guarded by two pawns, which is pretty good protection in my book. How should black use his free move? To develop the king knight toward the center, 4, knight g8, f6, 
a sailing white's E4 pawn. It is this pawn that becomes the chief focus for black's central counterplay, inasmuch as it is the only pawn actually occupying a central square. It's out there, so it's targetable. After one e4 c5, two knight f3, knight c6, three bishop b5, which is the more interesting knight move? Three knight d4 or three e5? Correct. Neither knight move is good, but of the two, we prefer three knight c6 a5, which we're going to say is more interesting. Funny thing is, it violates two basic opening principles. Supposedly, you should avoid moving the same piece twice, unless you have a special reason, and you shouldn't place a knight on the edge of the board unless the situation requires it. It turns out that three knight a5, though not a terrific move, does have hidden virtues, albeit mainly psychological ones. The move looks so bad that it would be natural for white to conclude that black is a poor player, but the move has been played in master practice, and it does contain a drop of poison for the unwary. One unsuspecting, overconfident player got a comeuppance after castling. Four kingside castle, black followed by an attack on the bishop, four a seven a six, which led to the careless retreat five bishop b five a four, an egregious mistake. So black hit the bishop another time, five b seven b five, and after the beleaguered piece withdrew again, six bishop a four b three. The c pawn ensnarled it for good, six c five c four. But let's get this clear: in preferring choice B, we're not really advocating three knight c six a five. Rather, we're merely using the move as an illustration to show that even the feeblest-looking concepts can have a positive side. Moreover, even when a particular move doesn't have much going for it. A player might assay it anyway, just to navigate the game into uncharted waters. By doing this, he hopes to put his opponent in a position where he actually has to play chess instead of being able to rely on the published analysis of others. World champion Emmanuel Lasker, eighteen sixty-eight to nineteen forty-one, who reigned at the top of the chess pantheon for twenty-seven years, eighteen ninety-four to nineteen twenty-one. Often employed this strategy against book-smart upstarts, and it usually worked. It's one thing to play by rote, and quite another to have to think for yourself. Of course, the game has gotten tougher and more rigorous since Lasker's time, and it's become more difficult to be a serious competitor without preparing your opening moves and defenses. But this experimental approach is still an excellent way for a developing player to learn faster and to acquire greater understanding. Generally, you don't really begin to comprehend why something is wrong before you've experienced the problem firsthand, probably losing several games in the process. Losing isn't fun, but winning is, especially when you succeed by doing it your way. This is how many of us learn best. By taking repeated chances, trying this and that, and gradually improving our efforts until we make them work, until we prove them to be true. If this isn't the right way for students to go, what is? After one e4 c5, two knight c3 e6, three g3. Which center pawn should Black move? Three d5 or three e5? Correct. The good pawn move is three d7 d5.
It's the logical consequence of black's second move, 2, e7, e6. After the two-square advance, 3, d7, d5, and the ensuing exchange, 4, e4 takes d5, e6 takes d5, Black's d5 pawn will come under additional fire by 5, bishop f1, g2. But Black's resources are quite adequate. He will be able to uphold d5 without making concessions, maintaining a central presence and a corresponding degree of activity. After 1, e4, c5, 2, d4, c takes d4, 3, knight f3, how should black defend his d4 pawn? 3, e5, or 3, knight c6? Correct. The safe and sound move is 3, knight b8, c6. The queen knight is brought to its most effective square. Why should black distort his game by trying to hold on to the d4 pawn? Better to develop as white invests some effort to recapture the pawn. In fact, there's a chance for white to stumble after 3, knight b8, c6. If white mechanically follows with the development of the light square bishop to queen knight 5, 4, bishop f1, b5, black pilfers a piece with the forking check, 4, queen d8, a5, check. White drops the piece because the black pawn at d4 guards c3, which prevents the queen knight from safely blocking the check in a way that also defends the b5 bishop. But white doesn't have to blunder with 4, bishop f1, b5. After the more logical 4, knight f3 takes d4, the players have reached a standard position in the Sicilian defense. 1, e2, e4, c7, c5, through a slightly unusual sequence of moves. It's the same position that would be achieved after the more typical order, 1, e2, e4, c7, c5, 2, knight g1, f3, knight b8, c6, 3, d2, d4, c5 takes d4, 4, knight f3 takes d4. Regardless how the position is arrived at, whether directly or through transposition, black is fine. After 1, e4, knight f6, 2, e5, knight d5, 3, c4, should black's knight move forward or backward? 3, knight b4, or 3, knight b6? Correct. The retreat 3, knight d5, b6 is in order. On b6, the knight is safe from further pawn attacks, except for one. The queen-bishop pawn can move to c5, besetting the knight once again. But this is fine, for the knight can return to d5, confident that no white pawn can thereafter coerce it from the center. This is so because, at this point, both the white c and e pawns would be on the fifth rank, past the frontier line, unable to actually attack d5. In fact, this very advanced pawn mass could prove to be a liability, in that white's c and e pawns may have outrun their supply lines. They would be closer to the enemy attackers and further from their friendly defenders. This is overextension, and it's the usual outcome of a failed onslaught. It's the way an unjustified assault is typically rebuffed, by hitting the attackers when they're disoriented and out of position. After 1, e4, e6, 2, d4, d5, 3, e takes d5, how should black recapture on d5? 3, queen takes d5, or 3, 
E takes D5. Correct. The sturdy pawn recapture 3, e6 takes d5 is the proper way to go. At d5, the black pawn braces the center, holding the white d4 pawn in check. This central symmetry means that white cannot claim an advantage in the middle. Center space is then dead even. Another plus for the black side is the release of the c8 bishop from captivity. When the pawn was on e6, before the take back 3 e6 takes d5, the queen bishop's line of movement was obstructed. After the capture on d5, however, the queen bishop suddenly has several new developmental squares to choose from, e6, f5, and g4. Moreover, the exchange 3 e6 takes d5 also opens the e-file for a black rook, so that white cannot freely use this line for his own rooks. If he attempted to use the king file at some future time by a subsequent rook f1 e1 after white castles kingside or queenside, he would encounter real opposition from a resistant black rook by rook f8 e8 after black castle's kingside or queenside. After 1 e4 e6, 2 d4 d5, 3 e5, which is a better c-file move? 3 c5 or 3 knight c6? Correct. The forward thrust of the bishop pawn, 3, c7, c5, wins hands down. The interlocking pawn chain in the middle, white pawns on d4 and e5, black pawns on d5 and e6, dictates the coming strategy. Here the pawns play the leading roles, not the pieces. The pawns must therefore be free to advance, unencumbered by obstructing knights and bishops. By starting the assault on white center with the advance 3, c7, c5, black attempts to undermine the pawn chain by knocking out its base, here the pawn at d4. Then, after the groundwork has been laid by first moving the c pawn to c5, Black can mount additional pressure on d4 by developing the queen knight to c6. If necessary, black can even follow with the development of the queen to b6, which also assails the square d4. But it can't be the other way around, moving the queen knight before the c-pawn. For if the queen knight is developed to c6 before the c-pawn is moved to c5, the c-pawn is suddenly blocked. It wouldn't be capable of moving at all, which means that black would probably be unable to pressure d4 significantly, inasmuch as his c-pawn and queen would then be out of the immediate picture. The c-pawn wouldn't be able to move to c5, and the queen couldn't follow by going to b6. After 1 e4 e6, 2 d4 d5, 3 knight d2, which is the better minor piece move? 3 bishop b4 or 3 knight f6? Correct. Developing the king knight, 3, knight g8, f6, continuing the pressure on e4, is a truer path to take. The immediate threat is to win the e4 pawn outright, for black has a 2 to 1 superiority on this square.
Deep Horn, and King Knight against Queen Knight. Black's idea is designed to force White into clarifying the central situation. Is he going to safeguard e4 by advancing the e pawn, or is he going to avoid loss of material by exchanging pawns on d5? If you get equal value, you haven't lost anything. White's most aggressive response is to push the king pawn 4 e4 e5, which attacks the f6 knight. Black doesn't mind this so much because it ends the central tension, which reduces the number of options that he otherwise would have to keep open. We don't mind a storm if it can be weathered, with clear skies to follow. After four e four e five, Black will probably draw the knight back to queen two, four knight f six d seven. His idea is then to follow with the advance of the queen bishop pawn to c five, five c seven c five, and the development of the queen knight to c six, six knight b eight c six. This is comparable to other lines in the French defense. White gains an edge in space because his king pawn occupies a square in the opponent's half of the board, but Black gets the ability to attack White's center because it's so close to Black's armed units. Who's in the catbird seat? As in so many instances, the stronger should come out on top. After one e four e six, two d four d five, three knight c three, which is the better minor piece move? Three bishop b four, or three knight e seven? Correct. The superior of the two moves is three bishop f eight b four. Black thereby develops the king bishop before the king knight, but this makes sense because the king knight doesn't as yet have a great place to go. Move it to e seven on move three, and you impede the king bishop at f eight. Place it on h six, and you put it in line to be captured by the c one bishop. So why not delay development until the king bishop has been stationed? Thereafter, the king knight can be moved to e7 without liability. As for the full merit of three bishop f8 b4, we can add that the move places a pin on the c3 knight. By rendering the steed immobile, Black threatens to capture White's king pawn. Four d5 takes e4. A typical way to answer this threat is for White to advance the king pawn, four e four e five, ending the tension and constricting Black's central formation, so that the c eight bishop's mobility is reduced. As a counter to this, Black may strike back with the undermining thrust four c seven c five, with the ensuing play mixing strategy and tactics globally across the board. Wait a nanosecond. Doesn't the move three bishop f eight b four violate the principle that advocates developing knights before bishops? Yes, it does. But then this is a fairly limited principle, with numerous exceptions. If you want to play good chess, ignore the principle and do what you think is right. If you want to demonstrate your ability to rotely remember platitudes. Start with this one about knights before bishops, and see if it helps you win real chess games. I tend to think it won't. After one e four c six, two d four d five, three knight c three, should Black take a pawn or develop a piece? Three d five takes e four, or three knight f six. Correct. 
Black aims to remove the e4 pawn from the board in the Karakhan defense. 1, e2, e4, c7, c6. So long as it remains in place, black is stuck for a good developing scheme. After the capture, 3, d5 takes e4, the pawn is replaced by white's queen knight, 4, knight c3 takes e4. But the e4 knight in turn is subject to harassment. Black can develop either a bishop, 4, bishop c8, f5, or a knight, 4, knight g8, f6, both of which storm white's centralized minor piece on e4. Or black can prepare an attack on e4 by first moving the queen knight to d7, 4, knight b8, d7. On the next move, he could challenge e4 by mobilizing the king knight, 5, knight g8, f6. Whichever of these plans is selected, black should do just fine. After 1 e4 c6, 2 d4 d5, 3 e5, should black develop or solidify his center? 3 bishop f5 or 3 e6? Correct. The better move is 3 bishop c8 f5 activating the bishop before it gets locked inside the pawn chain. After the queen bishop is so developed, then black can follow by advancing the king pawn 4, e7, e6. This illustrates why some players opt for the Karo Khan, 1, e2, e4, c7, c6, over the French, 1, e2, e4, e7, e6. In the Karo Khan, black can get his queen bishop out before it gets locked inside the pawn chain. He can't do this in the French defense, however, because the e6 pawn obstructs the c8h3 diagonal from move 1 onward. Thus, in the French defense, the c8 bishop is often identified as the so-called problem bishop because of its limited scope. After 1, e4, d6, 2, d4, knight f6, 3, knight c3, should black take a stand in the center or prepare further development? 3, e5, or 3, g6? Correct. There is no need to take a stand in the center just yet, so 3, g7, g6 is quite logical. Nor can white use this apparent respite to barrel through the center, for the d6 pawn provides just enough resistance to thwart the advance of white's king pawn. If white does follow by moving the king pawn, 4, e4, e5, black exchanges pawns, 4, d6 takes e5, 5, d4 takes e5, and then trades queens, beginning with 5, queen d8 takes d1 check. In the ensuing circumstances, black has excellent chances. If white doesn't push the king pawn to e5, black will use the next few moves to complete his development and to get the king to safety. Thus, black would probably continue by completing the fianchetto, 4, bishop f8, g7, and castling kingside, 5, kingside castle. Black might wind up not moving the king pawn at all. Instead, he could attack d4 by throwing out the queen bishop pawn to c5, thereby trying to obtain play while avoiding obstruction to the a1, h8 diagonal at e5. It's another way to go, and it's not a bad one. After 1 e4 d5, 2 e takes d5, queen takes d5, 3 knight c3, 
should the queen flee or do something aggressive. 3 queen a5 or 3 queen e5 check. Correct. Nothing wrong with running toward the board's outer perimeter, 3 queen d5 a5. At a5, the queen is safe from time-gaining attacks by white's pieces and pawns. So black can devote his efforts to calling up the rest of the forces. Curious thing is that even from the side of the board, the black queen incandesces tremendous power. For one, Her Majesty stands sentinel over the middle focal points at d5 and e5. Moreover, once white advances the d-pawn two squares to d4, which is bound to happen soon, the queen knight at c3 will automatically be in a pin, queen at a5 to king at e1. Thus, even though it costs black an extra tempo to get the queen to a5, it's not such a bad idea because of all that the queen does from there. After 1 e4 d5, 2 e takes d5, knight f6, 3 c4, which is the more traditional way to offer a gambit? 3 e6 or 3 c6? Correct. There may not be a best way to offer a gambit here, but 3c7c6 is the more typical method. If white accepts the challenge, 4d5 takes c6, black brings out the queen knight, 4 knight b8 takes c6, and zeroes in on d4. By following with a subsequent two-square advance of the king pawn, 5e7e5, black should have sufficient activity to justify the offer of a pawn. For this reason, many players prefer turning down the gambit, instead transposing into the panov Bodvinik attack of the Karakhan defense, with 4d2d4. It's usually arrived at by a different move order, 1e2e4, c7c6, 2d2d4, d7d5, 3e4 takes d5, c6 takes d5, 4c2c4. The other good thing about this transposition, as is the case whenever moves are transposed, is that its unexpectedness could take the play out of the opponent's hands. It's all about control. You want to maintain control when you already have it, and seize control when you don't. After 1 d4 d5, 2 c4 e6, 3 knight c3, which is the better knight move? 3 knight f6, or 3 knight c6? Correct. Developing the king knight, 3 knight g8 f6, is the better idea. Black thereby announces his intention to quickly position the king bishop, usually 4 bishop f8 e7, followed by castling kingside, 5 kingside castle. Once Black's king is safely tucked away, he can turn his focus to the center and queenside. The actual approach will depend on what white does. Black could decide to bolster the center by advancing the queen bishop pawn, c7, c6, or he may choose to menace white's queen pawn by the counter c7, c5. Still another plan is to flank the queen bishop, first advancing the queen knight pawn, b7, b6, and then deploying the bishop, bishop c8, b7. Regardless which of these schemes is selected, black has good options stemming from the building move 3 knight g8 f6.
after 1 d4 d5, 2 c4 d takes c4, 3 e4, which is the better move for black's king pawn? 3 e6 or 3 e5? Correct. The two-square advance, 3e7, e5, is the more enterprising and better choice. The reason many players would be dissuaded from trying it is that it appears to lose the king pawn. But the apparent offer is just a cog in a whole system of counterplay that enables black to hold his own. Up front we see two things about the move 3e7, e5. It places the king pawn where it can be taken for free by white's queen pawn. 4, d4 takes e5. But it also issues its own forewarning, menacing in turn the expropriation of the very thing threatening to capture it, that same white queen pawn. 4, e5 takes d4. If white responds by taking the king pawn, 4, d4 takes e5, Black trades queens. 4, queen d8 takes d1, check. 5, king e1 takes d1, leaving white's king vulnerable in the center, which is one of the key aspects of black's counter gambit. In order to avoid this debilitating queen trade and the concomitant change in fortune of white's king, white instead can answer 3, e7, e5 by the developing move 4, knight g1, f3. After the opening of the d-file, 4, d4 takes e5, and the exchange of queens, 4, queen d8 takes d1, check, 5, king e1 takes d1, black can retain his c-pawn, 5, bishop c8, e6, which ordinarily falls victim to white's f1 bishop, bishop f1 takes c4. This is why black can afford to sacrifice the e-pawn. He knows, on his side of the ledger, that losing the e-pawn doesn't matter so much, because he can keep his c-pawn, ensuring material balance. So we see the move 3 e7 e5, though a sacrifice on the surface, actually leads to equality in force. The reason it works so well is because it's played with a gain of time. The time is gained by virtue of the direct attack on white's d4 pawn which in some way must be answered. This threat stops white in his tracks. The move 3 e7 e6, on the other hand, does not. It threatens nothing, so white can merrily proceed with the building of a fine game. To buffer the sting of this counter gambit, 3 e7 e5, white usually delays the two-square advance of the king pawn, 3 e2 e4, instead opting to develop the king knight first, 3, knight g1, f3. This seizes control of e5, so that if black then offers the king pawn, 3, e7, e5, white can take it with the knight, 4, knight f3 takes e5, avoiding the opening of the d-file and the ensuing trade of queens. After 1, d4, d5, 2, c4, d takes c4, 3, knight f3, which is the better minor piece development? 3, bishop e6, or 3, knight f6? Correct. Black should ignore the c4 pawn and develop naturally with 3, knight g8, f6. The merit of the knight move is that it prevents white from advancing the king pawn two squares, 4, e2, e4. This means that to let out the f1 bishop and to attack c4, white will probably content himself with a one-square movement of the king pawn, 4, e2, e3. But while this is going on, black can pursue his own plans, moving the king pawn to king 3, 4, e7, e6, 
to prepare the combative thrust 5C7C5. This sudden pressure on White's D4 acts as a counterweight against his attack, ensuring that White's opening initiative does not get out of hand. After 1 d4 knight f6, 2 c4 e6, 3 knight c3, how should black develop his king bishop? 3 bishop b4 or 3 g6? Correct. The better move is to use the dark square to pin white's queen knight, 3 bishop f8 b4. By doing so, black neutralizes the knight and takes control of the square e4. If white were thinking of playing his king pawn up two squares, the idea now has to be put on hold. For after 4 e2 e4, black could take white's king pawn for free. 4. Knight f6 takes e4. Note how black's dark square bishop attacks both the c3 knight, which sits on a dark square, as well as the function of this knight, which is to guard e4, a light square. It's possible that white could menace the b4 bishop with the queen rook pawn, hoping to drive off the pesky minor piece. But this comes to nothing, for black has no qualms surrendering bishop for knight, 4, a2, a3, bishop b4 takes c3, check, 5, b2 takes c3. Although black has given white the two bishops at this point, he's saved time and doubled white's pawns. Here, this is not yet terribly significant. Moreover, black still retains control of e4, thanks to the f6 knight. After 1 d4 knight f6, 2 c4 g6, 3 knight c3, which is the better choice? 3 bishop g7 or 3 b6? Correct. Black has two good moves here. One of them is to complete the fianchetto started on the king's side, 3, bishop f8, g7. The other is to play 3, d7, d5, entering upon a branch of the king's Indian known as the Gruenfeld defense. Nothing other than these two moves makes much sense in this situation. For the most part, if you start a fianchetto, don't go off on a tangent and fail to consummate the fianchetto. Otherwise, you'll be stuck with the weaknesses engendered by the corresponding knight pawn's advance without the remedy of a bishop in place to offset those weaknesses. After 1 c4 e5, 2 knight c3, knight f6, 3 knight f3, should black defend the king pawn or push it? 3, knight c6, or 3, e4. Correct. The e5 pawn needs a guard, and black best supplies one by 3, knight b8, c6. In addition to protecting his center pawn by bringing out the queen knight, black maintains the equilibrium in development. This gives black two knights in the field, the same as white, so neither side is far ahead. Another satisfactory way to support the e-pawn would be with the queen pawn, 3, d7, d6. But this slightly inhibits the development of the king bishop at f8. Moreover, it's not yet clear if black should move the d-pawn two squares ahead instead of one, so perhaps it's reasonable to wait a few moves before deciding. Could there be a better waiting move than 3 knight b8 c6, 
a building idea that Black would like to implement anyway. After 1, c4, e5, 2, knight f3, knight c6, 3, d4, which is the better capture? 3, e takes d4, or 3, knight takes d4. Correct. Taking with the pawn, 3, e takes d4, is the loftier way. The capture is more or less necessary because the white queen pawn menaces an advance to d5, dislodging the c6 knight out of position. No time is wasted by the capture on d4, since in order to maintain material equality, white must spend a tempo to take back with an already developed piece. 4, knight f3 takes d4. After the take-back, black has a temporary initiative and can use it to develop a new piece, either the king-knight or the king-bishop. What about white's potential threat to take the queen-knight, doubling black's c-pawns? Black can ignore this, for after 5, knight d4 takes c6, he retakes with the knight-pawn, 5, b7 takes c6 adding pawn power to the center and opening the b-file for the queen rook. Certainly this is not a transaction for black to fear. After 1, knight f3, knight f6, 2, g3, g6, 3, bishop g2, which is the more natural move? 3, d5, or 3, bishop g7. Correct. The overwhelming and more natural choice here is 3, bishop f8, g7. This is so not because the other choice, 3, d7, d5, is so bad, but because once a fianchetto has been started, by moving a knight pawn, it should be completed. Otherwise, the move of the knight pawn becomes a total waste, and a weakening one at that. The knight pawn move, 2 g7 g6, only prepares the development of the king bishop. It doesn't constitute it. Until the bishop is actually deployed at knight 2, here g7, it's still undeveloped. Then there's the question of the d-pawn itself. Since black is going to flank his king bishop at g7, he is likely to be playing a dark square game, trying especially to influence the dark squares in the middle, d4 and e5. The pawn move d7, d5 attacks central light squares, not dark ones, so this advance is not particularly germane to black's kingside setup. This doesn't mean that black shouldn't play a two-square queen-pawn advance at some point. Perhaps black will shortly want to play d7, d5. But it might be better to see how the game develops before being so committal. For once you've made a pawn move, you're stuck with the consequences. After 1, knight f3, d5, 2, c4, d takes c4, 3, e3, should black defend c4 or develop a piece? 3, b5, or 3, knight f6? Correct. Since the c4 pawn cannot be maintained, black is advised to ignore it and play 3, knight g8, f6, developing a new piece. After white follows with 4, bishop f1 takes c4, regaining the pawn, black counters with the pawn attack 4, c7, c5, exerting pressure on the d4 square, where white is likely to place his queen pawn.
In this way, black is able to both develop and influence the center meaningfully, without incurring liabilities or insoluble problems. After developing the King Knight, 3 Knight G8 F6, black is starting to get ready for business. There's no chance to keep the extra pawn by the protective 3 B7 B5, and since the move itself is quite weakening, black shouldn't even bother with it. This defensive effort fails because black's resulting queenside pawn structure is unstable. It can be undermined and riven apart by the one-two punch of white's A and B pawns. The most thematic response to 3 B7 B5 is 4 A2 A4, a disruptive advance of the queen rook pawn. To keep his pawns united, black must now play 4 C7 C6. Defending with the queen rook pawn, 4 A7 A6, is refuted by the direct capture, 5 A4 takes B5, when the A6 pawn can't take back, 5 A6 takes B5 without exposing the A8 rook to apprehension, 6 rook A1 takes A8. After the temporary expedient 4 C7 C6, White first exchanges on B5, 5, A4 takes B5, C6 takes B5, and then follows with the unsettling pawn move 6, B2, B3. This threatens to win back the pawn by capturing twice on C4, 7, B3 takes C4, B5 takes C4, 8, Bishop F1 takes C4. And if black trades off the c4 pawn, 6, c4 takes b3, white delays the b3 recapture till after taking the b pawn with check, 7, bishop f1 takes b5 check. No matter how black replies, his opponent can answer 8, queen d1 takes b3, restoring the material balance and leaving white with the better game. White has the superior chances because he has more center pawns than his opponent, and also because black's isolated a7 pawn is a potential target along the a-file. White might be able to attack it a number of times, especially by eventually doubling rooks on the a-file. Can black offset the weakness of his queen rook pawn? He might be able to, but this would entail advancing the A-pawn in a timely and effective manner. Then it might be transformed into a dangerous past pawn, capable of becoming a new queen. Or maybe the opponent will be forced into making damaging concessions just to cope with it. But this is a long way off, and the way may not be real. After 1, b3, e5, 2, bishop, b2, knight, c6, 3, e3, which pawn move is more appropriate? 3, d6, or 3, a6? Correct. With the queen pawn's advance, 3, d7, d6, Black strengthens his king pawn, so that when white's bishop attacks the c6 knight, 4, bishop f1, b5, nothing is really threatened, because the king pawn is guarded by the d6 pawn. If black is concerned about the doubled pawns emanating from the exchange on c6, 5, bishop b5 takes c6, b7 takes c6, he can add reinforcement to c6 by 4, bishop c8, d7. Then on the next move, black can follow with 5, a7, a6, putting the question to white's b5 bishop. This practically forces white into an unfavorable exchange. 6, bishop b5 takes c6, bishop d7 takes c6, of bishop for knight with black obtaining the two-bishop advantage. Moreover, black derives good central play by virtue of this transaction. His center pawns will guard the dark squares, and his c6 bishop will patrol the light ones.